Welcome. I'm Patrick McNamara. I'm with the um, Nebraska World Affairs Council, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all here. This is a great collaboration with um, Indiana and Tennessee World Affairs Councils, and uh, our own Omaha guy now in uh, Indianapolis is Larry Samino. Larry, do you want to do a welcome on behalf of uh, Indiana? Yes, thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to extend my own welcome to our guest, uh, Carl Wilkins, and welcome the members and the guests of the Indiana Council on World Affairs. I thank you all for tuning in and offer special thanks to those of us, those from Indiana who've added a contribution to support the programs of our council. I want to thank Michael Adams, the director of the, uh, of the Nebraska chapter, for allowing us to partner with the Nebraska World Affairs Council on this very timely program. I'd also like to thank Pat Ryan from the Kentucky World Affairs Council for providing us each week with the What in the World weekly quiz, which they produce and which we extend to our members as one of the benefits of membership. So frankly, I consider the tragedy that befell Rwanda as a worst case cautionary tale of what happens when fear, prejudice, and hatred are deployed to foment rage and violence in society. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing Mr. Wilkins' presentation. So now I want to pass the baton to our friend Jim Shepard and the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Hello, Nashville. Ah, greetings from Nashville to, to the rest of the country. And on behalf of the World Affairs Council members and friends in Tennessee, we thank Michael, uh, Dr. McNamara, and the Nebraska Council for organizing this important program and really bringing all the sister councils on board. I think that this is a, a really good demonstration of the convening power of our national network to bring the world to our communities. Our council is very pleased to support this conversation, and we salute Carl for sharing his story of Rwanda in 1994 and its aftermath. The words never forget are easy rhetoric to recall the horrors of the Holocaust. But we all know that in the years since, the world has turned a blind eye to genocide, ethnic cleansing, and other crimes against humanity. It is only by never forgetting through the telling of stories like Carl's that we can hope to instill action into words. And lastly, I'll come into your reading list, a book uh, from the UN ambassador to the UN, uh, US ambassador to the UN, Samantha Power, A Problem from Hell. Our council hosted the ambassador last year, and she tackled the key question from the book, why do American leaders who vow never again repeatedly fail to stop genocide? Thank you again for uh, participating in this important conversation and certainly looking forward to, uh, to learning more. So I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Mer McNamara, I believe. Yes, I'm actually going to introduce uh, Megan Helberg, who um, is the is the connector here uh, with Carl. And um, Megan, you you went to uh, Rwanda and came back all inspired. Uh, you're now our Nebraska Teacher of the Year, and so it's with great honor that I introduce you in order to. Well, thank you, Patrick. Yes, as Patrick said, I'm Megan Helberg. I am a teacher in rural Nebraska, out here in Burwell with all the cows. And so I am this year's Nebraska Teacher of the Year. And I have a large passion for Holocaust and genocide education. And that is where um, I cross has with Carl. So I have the great uh, honor of introducing Carl here. So sometimes we kind of joke and say, you know, oh, the man, the myth, the legend. Carl Wilkins, you know, but I want to make sure that we realize that he is not a myth. What Carl Wilkins did was true and real, and he made choices, real choices, and the events he witnessed were very real. As you listen to Carl today, I ask you to try and give appropriate notice to all of the decisions and choices that Carl had to make. Some may have seemed minor at the time, but then led to a series of events that became very major. So ask yourself, what decisions and choices do I make every day that impact those around me? Are you aware of the ripple effect that you can create? I met Carl in 2017 at the Holocaust Museum in DC when I was selected to be a museum teacher fellow, which has opened up many amazing opportunities for learning and growth. And then Carl also came to 
right here in Burwell. He came to little old Burwell, Nebraska a couple of years ago and spoke to the school and students. And you know, Carl's presentation shook things up. And at first I wasn't sure how to react, but the more I thought about it, it was just what my school needed because that was the first step. Um, he opened the door to have some difficult conversations that needed to occur in our school and community. And sometimes it takes that person from outside the community to come in and shake things up. And that's what Carl did. Um, I was also very blessed to travel to Rwanda with Carl in July of 2018. And needless to say, it was a transformational experience. Um, I went in with the mindset of learning as much as I could about the genocide that occurred in 1994, um, but I came away with a completely shifted soul, I like to say. Um, it was one of those journeys that really transformed me, and I didn't even really know that I needed transformed, uh, but yet I welcomed that transformation. And that's where uh, uh, my mantra of looking for the good really uh, was born. So now as you look at the second thing I ask you to do is to pay special attention to how Carl and others, even in the midst of the worst events of humanity, a genocide, seem noticed or accessible, but then that is when they created good. And I hope that we all realize that it should be a relief to all of us to know that we are all capable of creating good. Carl Wilkins, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. So good to see you. And thanks for making this opportunity happen. Really appreciate that. Uh, Patrick and Jim and Larry, thank you all too for, for uh, helping us to spread the story out and about. I'm really looking forward to our conversation here today. Uh, some of you are enjoying lunch. And fortunately, I just had a big roll of, bowl of granola. So you're not making me hungry. I just thought I'd let you know that. And we're going to try here in the next 20, 25 minutes, um, we're going to explore a bit about Rwanda. And, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about our organization and how we're sharing the stories of Rwanda around the world. But we'll first look at the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, the loss of more than a million lives during that time. We're going to look at it primarily through the lens of our family, our, our very young family, the choices that Teresa and I had to make, uh, the challenges that we were facing at that time. We're gonna talk a bit about, well, a lot, I hope, about the 26 years of trust building in Rwanda. How do we put these things back together after such a horrific event? And then probably more during our conversation time, we're gonna talk about a shift in thinking from a punitive mindset to a restorative mindset. And um, I'm looking forward to, to each part of this conversation. Honestly, uh, I think that um, the best way that I can capture some of the 1994, invite you back there, is to play a few clips from a 40 minute film. They're just uh, gonna be a little short minute, a minute and a half clip each one. And if you'd like to see the whole one, this is what we send to schools before I come to visit. And they usually watch this 40 minute film to get, a, get some background, give us a head start. You can find it on YouTube. You just search, I'm not leaving, uh, full movie and you'll find that on YouTube. So let me make sure my volume's up. I meant to also say that every day of the horrific genocide, I had the privilege of talking to my courageous wife on a hand, sort of like a ham radio, a short wave radio. So we'll short start with just a little snapshot. You will also, I need to mention, clips American consulate officer. Um, we have some wonderful people representing our country all the world. So the captains wanted to just uh, share a couple of these clips. I think it was really interesting in Rwanda that when people were ordered to leave, uh, for some people, the idea of staying didn't even occur to them. 
And of course, the killing going on around here, the smart thing to do is get out of here. Get those who you love and safely get them out of there. The senior rebel official said the government forces and militia were responsible for the genocide between half a million and a million people. I think the several refugees who said there aren't going to be any good success in Rwanda. But in every situation, we have a choice. I mean, the choices might be greatly restricted. People would like to take that choice away, and sometimes we'd like to give that choice to other people. But but it boils down to uh, really we do we do have a choice, and, and and lucky is the person like me who had somebody like Teresa standing next to me, uh, making the choice together. We actually we actually heard the plane crash as it was it was shot down from the sky and the event that uh, that the extremists used to launch the genocide where the president of Rwanda and the president of Burundi were both killed. It's probably about five miles from our house. We quickly moved our kids into the hallway because within an hour there was gunfire throughout the neighborhood echoing around the hills. We wanted to put as many brick walls between our kids and the gunfire outside. Short little uh, family video clip from the next morning when we were woken up by gunfire. All right, a little bit of streaming issue. And so we'll see if that does come on here from in a moment. We had, as you saw in the picture, our three young children and we were doing our best Teresa and I, to make this seem like an adventure. You know, we pulled the VCR and the television into the hallway and pulled mattresses. What's going on here, huh? We got all the kids in the hallway and the television. This is April 7th, and uh, we're watching TV in the hall. It's about, about 6 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we were woken up at about 5.15, 5.20. Um, by a lot of gunfire and stuff. The day after the plane was shot down, there was slaughter going on at an orphanage to the east. We were talking on our ham radio with them, and they reported people coming onto their campus and people being killed there at the orphanage. And they were begging us to get help. Please send the UN. And so I managed, after quite a few attempts, to get the UN on the phone. The UN guy was really shook up. What do you mean you lost control of the airport? Now, how does the UN lose control of the airport? I remember looking at seeing groups of mostly probably young guys. They'd be carrying sticks or machetes. They'd be moving in groups of six or eight, probably going from one house to another. And it, it was very horrifying to think. You know, the, the choice that Teresa and I had to make um, became really challenging when the American government said we're all leaving. We, we had the, an idea this could happen. This didn't take us by surprise. We had even identified assembly points, evacuation plans. But the, the real challenge came when they said, yes, bring your family, but you can't bring any Rwandans with you. Um, if they're not from Rwanda, you can bring if they're from Tanzania, if they're from you know any of the neighboring countries or any other country, which it was only as I was preparing for this talk with you today that I realized I always focus on the part where they said you can't bring Rwandans because that was so relevant for us. We had this young lady who had lived and worked in our home for about three years loving on our kids. And when somebody loves on your kids, you know, that's like fast track to family. And she was of the minority, the Tutsi group that was targeted. And the young man who came in the evening as the watchman also minority targeted. And it was just as I was preparing for this one, I thought, well, you know what? They could have said no other countries. And it's really interesting. We'll get into this a little bit more, how one thing thinking can take over in a situation. But back to this story, Teresa and I, we go in the bedroom, we talk, we pray, we're forehead to forehead. And um, we've, got, we've got to make this decision. Uh, the Rwandans have given us so much privilege all the years we've been there. Maybe now we could use that privilege to help, to help some of them to, to survive. And so you will, um, you'll have just a short little piece here where uh, Teresa will describe a little bit of what's happening. There's also 
the interesting fact that my mom and dad were visiting. It's interesting. Right now, I'm the age my parents were 26 years ago when they were, when they were visiting during this time. So that added another really important dynamic into the I think situation. Carl, I recognize, it was a hard decision, not just for him, but yet we could be looking at the possibility of never seeing each other again. The harder part of this decision was her part, definitely. Much, much tougher. Um, for her to leave with the kids. And I know at that point in time, his thinking was, and I agreed totally. I knew as an director, he's there for not just the development aspect, but for the relief aspect too. He's been already working in these camps. And so it just seemed that there was, it would be right to stay. You know, the right thing to do is to stay. I'll never forget standing by our bedroom window looking out at the city which is built on hills there in Kigali and the, uh, this is what it's come to and, and this and see, I'm sending my wife and family. what do you mean you're sending them we're all leaving everybody leaving over and I said no I'm not leaving you kind of pause and you don't have a choice and uh, yes I, I do have a choice you can see this going back and forth and Finally, she says, okay, then I need you to sign on a piece of paper that you've refused the help of the United States government to leave Rwanda. And I remember thinking how incredibly hard of a decision that must have been to uh, be separated from his wife and kids and make the decision to stay. He had the opportunity because he had no and instead, the most They're leaving a genocide behind, and mom is giving them the message, it's okay, you know, we're gonna make it. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, and as Teresa said, we, we obviously, we didn't know, but we didn't focus on what we didn't know. We didn't focus on we may never see each other again. It was during some of those long nights during the genocide as I was then sleeping in the hallway that I was wondering if I would ever see them again, if I would see, you know, be there for, for as, they, as the kids grow up. And full disclosure this morning, this is really fun, you guys. Lisa here is in labor right now. I'm just waiting for somebody to stick their head in the door and say, he's here. <laughs> Lisa and, and her husband, Jay, got married, thanks. <laughs> got married uh, two years ago and I'm, I'm so excited. But okay, back to Rwanda and, and 1994. Um, we will have five of us in the house there. The young lady and the young man who were at risk of being killed, a, a Rwandan pastor and his wife, who will be, um, they, they were of the majority group, they weren't at risk, they could have gone to a safer part of the country, but they chose to stay with me, which was an incredible gift. Um, and, and just so I don't forget, I stuck in a picture, the young lady did survive after she married, she has these handsome sons today, the young man survived as well. But, but just two more glimpses from 1994. The pastor who was with me, he gave me this incredible counsel. After three weeks of 24 seven curfew stuck in the house at the beginning of the genocide, the government uh, relaxed the curfew just a bit. And, and I was saying, we gotta do more. What can we do, pastor? And he said, well, if you're gonna do anything, you've gotta build a relationship with the people in power. Now, that means the people who are committing genocide. Colonel Renzaho was in charge of the capital city of Kigali. He's in prison. He was hunted down, tried, convicted in prison for his role in the genocide. But I am going to begin to find allies in the most unexpected places. He will actually give me a travel permit so I can get through the different roadblocks. And he'll send me to uh, a large orphanage uh, in, in one of the most um, densely populated, poorest parts of the city. And in a nutshell, that's the work that I will do with my Rwandan colleagues throughout the three months of the genocide. We will be working to bring food and water and medicine to these groups of orphans. My uh, courageous friend Dawson, who um, worked with me before and during the genocide, my good friend Gasiqua as well. You know, it's interesting, every day while Gasiqua is out helping me and, and Dawson working to get water and food, Back home, he had more than 40 people he was trying to protect in his home, not with the privilege of a foreigner, but with the power of integrity. And when the people came he, to kill the people in his home, he literally greeted them with kindness. He said, hey, Bernard, your, your daughters must be hungry, huh? W would you like some chickens? 
I love to dig deeper into Gesiqua's story when we explore the three core values that are often at the center of our conversation, the values of respect, how we have an environment where we're looking for the good, we learn each other's stories, we connect the dot, empathy just comes naturally, and, and inclusion becomes a joy, not at all a duty. But we won't get too sidetracked there. Um, we'll come now to, okay, I'm gonna look here at my clock, make a quick, okay, we'll squeeze this one in. Last story from 94. Um, Gasequa and I show up at the orphanage one day with a truckload full of water and within minutes we're surrounded by these guys with machine guns. So this is the super abbreviated version as the, as the children are terrified inside, they've actually seen some of these men kill their parents. And, and it's a horrific, uh, seemingly impossible situation, but it will, after about a two to three hour standoff, um, a police officer will come, about seven of them, and they'll take over kind of holding the fort, and I will go appeal, end up, Renzaho, the colonel I told you about, he's not in town, but I go to his office, and his secretary tells me the prime minister is here. Now, they had killed the prime minister at the beginning of the genocide, and the extremists who took over put in their own, what I call bogus, John Kambanda, their prime minister. And this secretary will make the most, uh, 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 almost said obscene, but uh, the most absurd suggestion. Ask this man to stop the massacre at the orphanage. Now on the one hand, it seems so absurd because he's in charge of the genocide. On the other hand, he is in charge. If you're gonna do anything, you build a relationship with the people in power. And people, students often ask, well, what about the ethics of that? You know, those people, they deserve to be prosecuted and they will be prosecuted, but not that day. That day they were in power. That day, the potential for good was in the hands of this man who was one of the three running the genocide. And, and for various reasons, maybe we can talk about it if you like in the conversation, he will stop that massacre. This whole idea of shifting from a punitive mindset to a restorative mindset really hinges on two very powerful pillars for me. It's the value of every person and that every person is relational. Every person is relational. And when I truly embrace the idea of the value of every person and that every person is relational, then I just can't help, for that to be sustainable, it's gotta be driven by the idea that there is good, that there is good and the potential for good in every, <laughs> okay, an update not yet out. He's not yet out. All right, and so, um, so reunited with the family after that uh, horrible 100 days and we will, uh, yeah, family all grown up, as you saw. So there's the, there's the expectant mom and, and dad right there uh, who are, yeah, in a very unforgettable situation at the moment. And um, I will have the privilege of going back to Rwanda. Okay, that one I can turn down. I will have the privilege of going back to Rwanda. Um, sorry to blast your ears out there practically every year with a group of teachers. I've taken to calling it the little big country, you know, from giraffes to volcanoes. It is just really hard for people to believe that this is the same country where genocide happened. Uh, in the summer of 2019, I was back with a group of teachers and as Megan said, our, our uh, mantra for moving through that city and uh, that country and all the horrific stories is this idea of finding the good. And we're in a little rural town where perpetrators are literally living next door to survivors. A little, they call it a, a, restora, a, a reconciliation town, is what they call it. And the, the two people that I would like to zoom in uh, with you uh, on are Maria, who survived, lost her husband and sons, but she and her daughter survived, and Philbert, who was 19 at the time of the genocide, and Maria would introduce you to Philbert as an incredibly valuable family friend. I mean, helping with harvest and planting and hauling water for my cow. She says, he does things for me like my sons would have done. But as you might begin to imagine now, or maybe not, 
Filbert wasn't just involved with killing. And I honestly, you can see me pause, you can hear me pausing right now. Because some of these stories seem so unbelievable. And it's like, are you just going for sensationalism? But, but these stories are not one in a million in Rwanda. Filbert was involved with the gang who killed Maria's husband and sons. That's 26 years ago, okay? I'm gonna talk about that a little more and my struggle with Filbert because I was pretty stuck when I heard what he did. I, I don't care if he helped plant crops and he you know, does things that her sons would have done. My thoughts are if he wouldn't have killed them, they would be here. So I think you, you can understand some of this frustration of the reframing in the restorative journey. And this idea of forgiveness, we're not going deep unless you want to in the conversation, but we're just sticking with the very basic idea of forgiveness to cease to feel resentment against somebody. This is, this is not, forgiveness is not to trust, forgiveness is not fondness, forgiveness is not everything's gonna be like it used to be, forgiveness is not social engagement. That's reconciliation. And that is what's happened with Maria and Filbert. But there's no conflict between forgiveness and have calling the police and somebody being arrested and prosecuted and put in jail. There's no conflict there in that happening. The idea that I want to hold central is how do we cease to feel resentment? So we're going to look at the, the big picture of, the, of the, the national picture in Rwanda and their effort at building trust again in the country. Three initiatives. We'll look a little deeper at Gachacha, just briefly at the Tij camp, where you could go to reinvent yourself, and then what happens when you get home and you start to have shared experiences after uh, these initiatives. So the first one, Gachacha, I love when we're looking at these to use four lenses, which come out of restorative processes. The, the lens of what kind of healing habitat, what kind of environment do we need to have for this trust building to happen? How can we truly understand the harm, really fully understand the harm that happened? Because um, some people think, oh, you just want me to forget it, what happened or anything? No, with restorative mindset, you actually go deeper into understanding the harm, I think. Then how do we work to we don't want in the case to murdering their neighbors. We don't want them to just kind of be back to where they were before, hoping that if you go through a restorative process, you'll be made super to me, super. So a little deeper look at the first thing. Now, really, uh, we couldn't do the, the normal modern court system. We don't have enough judges. We don't have enough stationary, okay? So Rwanda reached way back in their history, and they pulled out this thing called gachacha. There were no courts back in the old times. There were no prisons. You got the elders in the, in the middle of, of town under the tree, and, and they say a literal translation of gachacha is justice on the grass. People were told, pick, send people in your community who you trust. You see them with sashes here. The sashes actually say people of integrity. Think about this. Um, it's one thing to talk about integrity in our day-to-day -day life, talk about integrity in elections, but somebody who's just come through a genocide, integrity can take a whole new meaning for this. And these people are given kind of a crash course as facilitators slash judges. They won't really be doing the traditional judge form. Here's the deal, we got thousands of people locked up some for several years without their case ever coming. We just, what are we gonna do? We can't let them roam free. They've been accused of genocide by more than one person. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna empower the people. You pick, you pick people you trust in your community and make sure at least 30% are women. That's the, that's the um, uh, modus of operandi, that's the MO in Rwanda, that a minimum of 30% of all decision makers are women. As a result, today their parliament is over 60% women. And so anyway, here in the local village, we pick them. You want to get out of prison, you want a little bit of a fast track and maybe even have your prison time cut in half? Confess. Thursday afternoon, school shut down, often Thursday, shop shut down, everybody goes to the soccer field. Prisoners come out and start confessing in front of the, in the place, often in the neighborhood where their crimes were committed. 
they're not only confessing, but people in the community are able to ask questions. Um, somebody asked me not so long ago, how do you know if they're sorry? And, and then we got to talking about, is remorse um, key, foundational, for a confession to be valuable? And as we talked about it in the context of Rwanda, we said, well, a confession helped people learn where family members were buried. A confession helped people learn, you know, who, who gave away the hiding place of my sons. Many things that people for years had been what ifing in their mind, running these cycles over in their mind. Now they're getting the truth. And, and say we have somebody who isn't sorry. He's not remorseful. He has so rationalized his actions that there's no remorse. He comes out in the sunlight, the soccer field. He starts looking around and sees a 12 year old young lady over there. I wonder if that's my, my brother's daughter. I've never met her. Um, oh my goodness, I think that's my old school teacher over there. And now he needs to confess. And now as he's confessing, his story, this is what's so powerful here is the power of stories. His story, which was so finely put together with his own rationale that eliminated remorse, now starts to crack and crumble as he sees his story landing on the ears of potentially his niece. Landing on the ears, he sees the expression of his now retired school teacher. And perhaps for him, that's the beginning of remorse in this journey. So we could go a lot deeper as we look at each of these lenses on Gachacha, the safety, you know, it's like a, a, a telescope and as we look through the lens of a healing habitat, we see, yeah, safety, super, super important. What else is necessary? Well, in Rwanda, they said, bring them back to the location where it happened. Really important for this restorative process. And we go on down through the harm, how all voices are there, confessions, questions. In repair, well, it began, as I found out, where my husband was buried. The missing pieces of the puzzle come back together and potentially the beginning of remorse. Now, if we, were, if we were in kind of a full-blown workshop here, we'd be digging in to the Tiege camp from the Gachacha after confession. And, and understand this, they did break the perpetrators into three groups, the highest level, like that prime minister, and even the colonel who was in charge of the city, mid-level people, and then the ordinary people like Filbert. Most of Gachacha, Gachacha was mid-level and lower level primarily. And um, the Tiege camp, this is a place where you could go to reinvent yourself, was primarily uh, ordinary civilians, level three people who were there. They are going out to be given a chance to reinvent themselves in the community. And just one snapshot from the Tiege camp, talk about the healing habitat. There's no fence, there's no wall, and the guards don't have guns. There's incredible buy-in from the perpetrators and the community for this to work. When I first went back to Rwanda and was driving over these hills and I looked out in the valley, I'm like, what, is that a refugee camp? Because I hadn't been back to Rwanda for nine years. This was 2005. And, um, and my, my uh, friend who was with me, he goes, oh no, that's a Tiege camp. I'm like, what? Yeah, that's guys who confess. They're doing radical terracing. They're building houses for widows. They're, they're what I've come to call reinventing themselves and i'm like what what about the people living around there because i'm still thinking about safety and security so i won't go any deeper in the tiege process unless you want to in our conversation and oh my goodness the neural pathway one okay just one quick second here understand when we're learning times tables we form new neural pathways when we're learning directions to a place when we're learning a language when we're learning how to play chess we're constantly forming new neural pathways what was really hard for me for so long was okay i believe because i saw it with my own eyes how people could go from kind and generous to murderers we saw the bodies but this part this restorative part Man, full of all kinds of suspicion and cynicism about that. And something that has helped me so much in now being a believer of that restorative part is the biology of our ability to build new neural pathways based on our choices. And not just me, but perpetrators and everyone. So we'll, we'll touch on that just a little more. Okay, I've got to, I'm into our Q&A time. So here we go. 
when people got home, we talked about shared experiences. Maria and Philbert were involved in shared experiences of building homes, making adobe bricks. So a quick little snapshot here of, uh, yeah, we can come back to all of the other national healing habitat initiatives that happened uh, if you want in our conversation time. But let's step in a mud pit right now. We're working the mud to the right consistency to put it in the molds, to make adobe bricks, to build homes. You're a survivor and um, been working all day, it's hard work. And we're rotating out through the mud pit. And the next person to come into the mud pit next to me is a guy who was just released from prison. I have a choice right now as a bunch of thoughts fire through my mind. Will I spend time with the thought that says, just my luck, I'm stuck in here with a killer? Because it's really easy to imagine that my next thought might be, they should have been locked up and thrown the key away. Or if I've made a habit of finding the good, this restorative mindset, shifting from punitive to restorative, there's a possibility that I might have a thought in my head that says, hey, I'm glad he's here. We can use all the help we can get. This is hard work. And with opening that door in my mind to embracing, welcoming, hey, I'm glad you're here, my next thought might be, I wonder how his kids are doing, huh? What's it like having dad home after how many years? And, and that restorative pathway just, it inspires so much hope in me. I said I struggled with Filbert, and I won't go into detail unless you want to in the conversation, but here's the key to why I was struggling so much with Filbert. It is, I think, one of the biggest obstacles to reconciliation, to restoration, to healing a relationship is one thing thinking. I was stuck in 1994. I could only see Filbert as a killer. Maria was stuck there too initially, she would tell you. I didn't want to see him. I didn't want to be around him. But day after day, week after month after month, Filbert apologized to her multiple times. And when I heard that, you think I was happy? I don't know what you're thinking, but I was like, once is enough, thank you, and then leave her alone. I'm, I'm not proud of my thoughts, my thought patterns, because when I'm saying leave him alone, I am, I am very much leave her alone when I say that. I am very much of the mindset of we're going to solve a problem by just getting him out of the picture. And that's the same thinking that drives genocide, the exclusive problem solving. Maria, on the other hand, will demonstrate an incredibly powerful tool um, that I don't even know if she says it in these terms, but this is how I understand it. When I heard that um, Maria was not only friends with Filbert, but she invited Filbert to, the, to, their, to her daughter's wedding, I was like, no, no. This was June for me. The previous July, I mean January, had been our wedding of Lisa and Jay, 2019. Wedding stuff was fresh in my mind. And I was like, family and all that wonder. And I'm like, Maria, I just have to ask you, how did you, didn't you have some family or people who were upset with you for inviting this guy? And Maria, very graciously, very patiently, she looks at me with this smile. And she says, yeah, but, and this is where Maria puts this move on me, so to speak. I had her right in the middle. And Maria very deftly steps out of the middle and puts Filbert in the middle and says, but his family was upset with him when he asked my daughter to be the godmother of his children. And to me, this is another incredibly powerful tool and strategy for getting free from anger and bitter. I'm going to leave this here. Uh, yeah, our idea of America today and that shift is going to be up to you. I'll come back to this slide, but I'll just kind of close off our time right now with this quote from Bell Hooks. The choice to love is the choice to connect. To see yourself, the opportunity to connect. I know some of you have to dash off. I totally get that. I know on Zoom it says, oh, so-and-so left the room. Don't feel bad. We're not going to judge you, you know. <laughs> and, and the organizers were kind enough to say, well, Carl, afterwards, if you want to share, you know, your information and how people can support your work. I, I was like, really? All right. And so 
this is some of the stuff we do. And if some of you are interested, whether it's a school, a faith group, or a business, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, retreats, brown bag lunches, client appreciation events, any of that stuff, we're happy to continue a conversation and explore deeper these things that we've explored today. So thanks so much, World Affairs Council. Thanks to Megan for connecting me to these folks. And I'm looking forward to learning more about World Affairs Council. Great. Thank you, Carl. We have a couple questions. Um, the first, you kind of touched on it, but maybe you could uh, maybe further give us some advice or opinions on how can the restorative justice uh, journey be used as an effective tool without a major tragedy taking place, like just in our normal everyday lives? How can we put that into practice? Absolutely. You know, when you, when you think about um, these four lenses that we were talking about, uh, looking at each of these initiatives, this could work for a little sister who took your cell phone. You know, what is, and you know this, Megan, as a teacher, the idea of respect in the classroom and having a healthy healing habitat is not just a crisis thing. That's a day-to-day -day thing. We want that healthy environment. And how do we restore it if it's gone? That would be another conversation that I would love to start with that idea of respect, empathy, and inclusion. But then we need to understand what's really the harm that's happening here. And sometimes we find out, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. <laughs> Emotions took, a, took the driver's seat and logic was chucked in the back seat. And so the idea of developing muscle memory to go down through a process of, am I keeping a healthy, really what was, I gotta hear all the, understand the harm. And then it is to have the worst be brought out in us, but to strengthen the best that's within us. And you know, I could go a lot deeper, but I'm going to just stop with those four lenses for ordinary everyday stuff. Great. Thank you. Another question we have is, uh, who came up with the restorative justice plan for Rwanda? Sorry, that's my school bell. Um, that's but, you know, really who came up with it, and um, are other countries using it as uh, as a model? Yeah, yeah, no, that's an excellent. Um, that's a great question, and I don't. I give a lot of credit to President Kagame in Rwanda. He's um, he has done incredible work over these last twenty six years. And uh, nobody, as we all know, is perfect. So you can read all different articles. Usually the media is picking on the most negative. Um, media often doesn't write with a restorative mindset. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, that's another subject. Um, but the idea, I think, well, let me just give you an example. Rwanda had the death penalty. And there was a lot of counsel from the outside. And Rwanda has been really open to counsel all the way from what kind of health system should we set up? Because they're they're their country was basically raised. It was, it was like destroyed. And they were not rebuilding from zero, but from below zero because they were struggling with the issues of trust. You know, one of the biggest casualties after the loss of human life, which you can't compare. But then the idea of the loss of trust and how do we rebuild that? So Rwanda's constantly been looking at, at the healthcare system. You know, they've, they've, they've spent a lot of time looking at... Um, Singapore and different things they've done there. And in all of these areas, Rwanda has been looking, how do we build a memorial to, re to um, rightly honor and educate after the genocide? And they were, in, they were in Nanjing, China, to look at you know, what happened, the memorial there, they're at the US Holocaust Museum. They're really um, big on learning from others, but also, people need to recognize when they come to Rwanda, we Rwandans know our country, we know our history, we're smart, we're brilliant. They're not gonna say that, I'm saying that. And we have a strategy. We welcome partnerships, but this old idea, this post-colonial idea, colonial, post-colonial idea that, you know, somebody from outside is gonna come fix the problem, somebody from outside is gonna be the leader in the initiative and stuff like that, no. That's not, that's not what happens here in Rwanda. We welcome your, we need your partnership. 
but they've really taken ownership of those things. And, and one of the ways, um, even though they got counsel from many people about the death penalty is going to be really essential, advocates of the death penalty, um, they quickly realized no. And President Kagame had to travel around the country. We didn't have to. He chose town hall meetings to explain to people why we are not, why we are doing away with the death penalty. Because you can only, I can only imagine people saying, boy, if ever there was a need for a death penalty, what they did to my family, and you hear that spirit of punitive as support opposed to restorative. President Kagame had many of his own family members murdered in the genocide. So reaching back into their historical past, listening to others, and then empowering themselves for the long term, the long game would be some of the strategies. Um, their minister of justice right now, a brilliant, articulate, humble man, who I wish he could be here to answer that question for you, um, because he would be able to tell you a lot more. I, just a few thoughts. Thanks for that question. Oh, in other countries, um, to a degree. I mean, I'm hoping that in America, because you've heard this this morning, this restorative idea will begin to take root for some. And some of you, you're already restorative practitioners, I'm sure. And we might think, well, hmm, that will never work in America's system. That will never work. That kind of thinking will never work. <laughs> but Rwanda tells us, no, 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 don't be so quick to say that will never work. And so um, this, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I better, our time is short. Okay, another question we have is, how is this phase of Rwanda's history referred to now? Okay, really, really good. Good, good question. Um, yeah, who writes the history books? Uh, for years in Rwanda, this was super hard to teach about the genocide because it was so fresh. You had, you had your students, um, family members in prison or family members who had been killed. You're sitting across the aisle, incredibly difficult. So in Rwanda, they started teaching more intentionally about the Holocaust. Not so fresh, obviously, but the parallels really powerful there. Young people themselves took it on themselves because they're like, we want to know what happened in our country. Today, somewhere around 70% of the population of Rwanda was either um, really tiny in terms of uh, uh, really young in term at the, at the genocide or not born at the time of the genocide. And so um, a lot of them just don't, weren't, they weren't eyewitnesses to it. And so young people in the high schools have formed what they call never again clubs, where they have been learning and then they become the educator to the middle school from the high school. And of course, the Kigali Genocide Memorial, some of you would like to, I'm sure, dig deeper there. You just Google Kigali Genocide Memorial. You'll find lots of stories and initiatives where they're training educators, where they're actually having a peace education program now that um, is taking principles of what happened with identity during the genocide and how does identity shape how we think about ourselves and the others. We need a Rwandan identity first and foremost. Yes, there's a Tutsi identity. Yes, there's a Hutu identity. Yes, there's a Twa identity. First and foremost is though a Rwandan identity. So a lot of initiatives, both government and education wise in building a healthy concept of identity, which in America, this is what our, I think and what I read, our polarization is not about different ideas and opposing ideas, it's about identities. And, and identities that uh, see themselves as so different. But that wasn't part of this question. So anyway, thanks for that one, Megan. Okay, maybe uh, one more here. We have, uh, have Tutsis who fled uh, been welcomed back into Rwandan society? And maybe we could even say Hutus as well. Have they been welcomed back Absolutely. into Rwandan society? And are they allowed to participate in government? Absolutely. Um, I am kind of frantically here looking for a picture. It'll be at the end here. I got to go back to Rwanda seven times last year, which was just an incredible, an incredible gift. And um, on the last time back there, okay, I am not finding his picture. So I'm going to just pop this one up. Um, 
we were, it was the National Dialogue Council. I call it a reverse state of the union. Every year in Rwanda for two days, the president, all the cabinet ministers, all the governors, all the mayors, they sit for two days listening to the people, sending in their uh, WhatsApp messages, their, their tweets, their emails and stuff. How's the government program matching with your priorities? And as the people would speak, whether they were in this 25 member convention hall or whether they were on a remote video located site on the, you know, by Lake Kivu or somewhere out in the rural areas, they always started with a thank you. Thank you for the new cancer hospital in our part of the country. Um, but the road leading to it, oh my goodness, question goes to the Minister of Transportation. One of the boy, one of the young men who was at another conference center with another 2,000 young people about 10 miles away from this one he came up and he says i just want to say thank you for the bursary that my brothers and i are benefiting from and i don't have anything to ask uh, except to ask the people who are outside of rwanda the rwandans outside to come home i'm especially asking my dad to come home now the whole convention center you could hear a pin drop and i don't know what's i'm listening through translation but i don't know the backstory most of the people know the backstory. This young man's father is currently the leader of what you would call the leading, what Rwandans would call the leading terrorist group that is trying to unseat the government in Rwanda and finish the genocide. So this young man, obviously from a Hutu family, whose father is in the Congo leading these military initiatives against Rwanda, these destabilizing initiatives, this boy is appealing to his dad to come home. And I am, I'm astounded on several levels. Number, number one, because um, I know there are other people who have come back, laid down their guns, come back, and have become part of the Rwandan government today. It, a lot of it depends. Not everybody who was in the old military had genocidal blood on their hands. So unlike what we did in Iraq and say, okay, nobody is going to be part of this new government here from the old system, the Ba'ath Party, in Rwanda, very intentional, looking at each case by case and calling people back. But get this, it's not just this young man appealing to his father, which was so touching, but the sons of the leading enemy, you could say, well, one of the leading enemies of Rwanda received government bursaries, which don't grow on trees. That is an incredibly powerful message for me of restorative thinking. You don't have to be defined by your father what he has done. You can chart your own course. And so this idea of welcoming people back is big time in Rwanda. They were paying for some years, they were paying plane tickets for people. I had a friend who was a nurse. He stayed out for like 12 years. Rwandan government paid his plane ticket to come home. We need nurses back here, you know, and you didn't just have to be a nurse. So the, the, the welcome mat is really out. Now you will need to face, if you have genocide, there is accountability. And that's what's also really important to understand in the restorative process. So many people think, oh, we're doing away with accountability. No, not, not in the true restorative process. There is accountability, but that accountability is always influenced and under the, the guidance of repair. And how can we repair at the same time as holding accountable? We are up to our time, Megan. Thank you so much. Yes, I just want to thank you, Carl, for giving us your time today, especially during this special time with your daughter. And so um, I hope that everybody who's still on the call will, maybe you're like me, you listen to Carl and then some things you have questions about and what he says will stick with you for many days, weeks, and months later, um, and maybe start to make more sense as you have time to sort it out um, and will come into your own life. At least that's how it was for me. So Carl, every time I learn something new from you. I hope you'll feel free to even shoot me an email if you have questions. You are not bothering me at all, okay? Continue the conversation. Happy to do it by email. Carl.WilkinsYahoo.com. Great. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful holiday season. And I will turn it back over to Dr. McNamara for any final thoughts. If Michael's with us, Michael, you want to uh, do a final thank you and sign off? Yes. Thank you very much, Carl. This is amazing. I hope we were all able to take away many, many lessons, uh, life lessons from you. 
And I want to thank all the attendees as well. I should mention we will, we've recorded this session and we will be posting it on the, the three World Affairs Council's uh, YouTube sites, the Nebraska, Indiana, and Tennessee YouTube sites. So thank you again to everybody and we'll see you on the, the forthcoming events. Thanks. Take care. Thank you.